So yeah, really, really excited to be here. I'm excited to talk to everybody about Llama 2. So when we originally released Llama, we were really blown away by the reception in the community. So there was recently this work put out called a survey of large language models that tries to capture a lot of the things that have sprung up in the Llama ecosystem before we released Llama 2. This is not meant to be exhaustive or anything like that. And we were really, really excited to see all of this. And I think when you think about the development of technology, a lot of the work that we have done and that we rely on every day uh, involves a lot of open source tooling that we leverage. And that's how the scientific community advances. And so a lot of this formed our backdrop for the work that we do in Llama 2 that I'm going to talk about today. And of course, we, we received many of these uh, types of encouragement to free the llamas. And so this is something that we had top of mind as we worked on Llama 2. So at a very, very high level, I want to start with like, what is the difference between Llama 2 and Llama 1? And then I'll cover a little bit throughout this talk on the different stages of training Llama 2 and how we got, got to it. So at a high level, what we open source, there's three different model parameter sizes, which you see displayed on the left. So there's a 7 billion parameter model, a 13 billion parameter model, and a 70 billion parameter model. So for various different use cases, usually the 70 billion parameter model is the largest, uh, has pretty good quality compared to the smaller ones. But we actually found surprisingly that many people, especially for various practical applications, were using the 7 billion parameter one simply because it's the fastest and the smallest. The pre-training, uh, the architecture stays pretty similar. We use a very standard transformer-based architecture to do this. There's two things that I would say are of note. The first one is the pre-training data set. We use two uh, trillion tokens of text found on the internet, predominantly in English, rather than 1.4 trillion, which was present in Llama 1. We also adjust the data mix. So when you train a lot of these models, it, the distribution of the data that goes into pre-training is very important. So you can think about you know, if your model only saw newspapers at pre-training time, then it wouldn't be able to generalize very well to other things. And so we also experiment with a slightly different modified uh, data mix in Llama 2. Further, we've expanded the context length. So Llama 1 had a context length around 2,000 tokens. Uh, here it's about 4,000. And then most importantly, we also released the fine-tuned model for different chat use cases. So since uh, GPT, uh, chat GPT has been released, you know, people are very used to kind of conversing with the models and giving instructions in a kind of multi-turn interchange format. And so that's what we worked on. This is powered a lot by two types of data annotation that I'm going to describe, supervised fine-tuning data and human preference data. So how is Llama 2 trained? So there's three core steps. The first one I'm going to talk about is pre-training. So, so this is where you have your standard language model decoder training, where you have a bunch of data that you usually pull from the web. You process it. You do self-supervised learning to produce your base model. Then subsequently, we do fine tuning to make it a chat model. So we turn a base model into something that is able to understand this kind of multi-turn type conversation, which then feeds our human feedback loop, where we collect large numbers of human preference data. It's displayed in the, in the upper side here to produce different reward models for both helpfulness uh, and harmlessness. And then that feeds our iterative model improvement cycle, which is shown um, a little bit more in the middle, uh, where we use reinforcement learning with human feedback. So first, starting on pre-training, uh, biggest thing in Llama 2, more compute and longer pre-training. So Llama 2 used about 1.5x the amount of compute as original Llama 1. So if you look here on the graph, the y-axis is training perplexity, which is a metric that the lower it gets is better. You can think about it as a proxy of the model's capability to internalize all of the information present in the training data set. So the lower you get, the better. The x-axis here is the amount of training data, so the more uh, the better. And so you can see the different colors. So the red line represents the smallest model, and all the way down to the pink line is our largest model. So you can see as you scale the model size and the amount of data, the model is better able uh, to remember all of this information. Um, other things that maybe are of note in the pre-training that you know, we cover a little bit more in the paper, we don't substantially change a lot of the pre-training parameters, some adjustment of the learning rate, and so on to accommodate for the larger uh, data size. Uh, but overall, it stays pretty similar. I now want to talk about the step of actually converting it from a base pre-trained model, like a general language model, and how do you convert it to an actual llama uh, to kind of chat type model. And um, this is with supervised fine tuning. So supervised fine tuning is the collection of, well, the usage of different prompt response pairs. And you can use this to help the model understand various different instructions. And so the chat kind of 
style that we're very used to interacting with in ChatGPT is what we're uh, aiming for. And so to bootstrap some of our initial supervised fine-tuning models, we actually heavily leverage existing open source data sets that are available for use. So you can think about dialogue data sets or other types of data sets. You can um, you know, take them, convert them into this type of format. You can generate a lot of synthetic data. And there's also been a lot of open source different supervised fine-tuning data sets out in the community for uh, large language model training. So we started with that to kind of bootstrap our ability to create a supervised fine-tuning Llama chat model. However, one of the things we realized pretty quickly is that if you think about the supervised fine-tuning data, there's kind of three different ways you can think about it, or three different axes to determine if it's good or not. Those are like quality, you know, you want the highest quality data, proper English grammar, stuff like that. You want diversity, so you don't want to cover only one slice of topics. You want it to be general and cover a lot of different topics. And the other is quantity. Of course, the, you know, if data was infinite, we'd probably be the happiest. And so what we then did was we embarked on a lot of high quality data set annotation. Uh, so for example, the top here, it shows an example of the helpfulness data set annotation. So I want to pause and just be like, this is really, really hard to achieve this annotation task. So this is like an actual example where the annotator is asked to write a poem about the first 10 elements of the periodic table, which is an extremely challenging annotation task. And so this is where we found that quality control is really important and boosting the quality of this annotation. It's actually better to have a smaller number of high quality supervised fine tuning examples. Um, and so as we collect more and more of these, we actually no longer use the open source uh, supervised fine tuning data sets in our final model. We also do a supervised fine-tuning annotation for harmlessness. So you can see that depicted in the latter half of the screen, where the prompt is something like, I want you to roast me, like give it to me like really, really brutally, and that might not be very safe. And so I think you can think about this as, you know, we want the models to be helpful, but then if someone asks, like, how do you build a bomb, that's not necessarily a question that we want our models to be able to answer. So being able to balance the helpfulness and harmlessness is really important. And for a lot of our safety fine-tuning annotation work, a lot of it is like you know aligning on the guidelines for the annotators to agree on what is and isn't safe, and then the right tone for that response. Okay, so uh, once we have a supervised fine-tuned uh, Llama chat model, I'm going to talk next about the reinforcement learning and rejection uh, sampling training pipeline that we use. And so we predominantly use two techniques for reinforcement learning with human feedback. Um, this assumes that the reward models already exist, which I'll talk about right after. Um, and so the first one we use is rejection sampling. So you can think about rejection sampling as a very breath-first type exploration of the space. So the idea is that the model will be given a prompt and will sample uh, the k possible different responses for that prompt. And so you can, you know, language models are not deterministic, and so they produce very different output. Um, and so here we sample k different. Uh, responses for each prompt, and we use our reward model to evaluate the quality of those things. Then the highest scoring response, uh, according to the reward model, actually is then used uh, to back propagate uh, and continue to train iteratively. And so you can think about this as kind of very exploring the space. One thing to note here is that Sometimes the model can degrade in performance. So one of the things we found is that our version three of the model actually had uh, poor poetry rhyming um, type behavior. And one of the things we tracked this down to is that before when we were doing the rejection sampling, we had restarted at every single model iteration. But one of the things we did learn from that and adjusted is that we used prior examples as well and also scored those with the reward model. We also use proximal policy optimization. If you are all RL people or some people study RL, you definitely know more about this uh, than I do. The idea of PPO, which we use at the last step for our final model, we primarily rely on rejection sampling, but for our final model, we do a PPO step at the end as well, um, where we use a reward model that's a combination of the harmfulness and the harmlessness reward model put together um, to score. OK, moving on, I want to talk about uh, the human feedback uh, data and how we train our reward models. So in order to understand if the model we produce, you know, the Llama 2 chat model, aligns with what people expect and to be able to improve the quality based on the user expectation, we do a lot of large-scale human uh, feedback annotation data collection. So the way this works is that the user or the annotator is given you know, a little interface. They can enter their prompt, and they get a variety of different model responses in, in return that they can basically look at and decide which one they like better. 
So in order to provide a variety of different possible model responses, you can sample from different variants of the model. So you know, different parameters or different versions. Or you could also up the temperature and just sample from the same model. It's very important that you have a little bit of variety, though, so that the human annotator can express their preference. If everything looked very similar, then it's, it's not really like, uh, that important. Another thing that we do is that it's not a binary preference annotation. So people don't get two things and they're like, OK, I like A or I like B. It's actually a little bit more fine grained. So people are asked to say, like, OK, I like A significantly more than B. I like A a little bit better than B, or about the same, a little bit worse, or uh, quite a bit worse. And we found that this more fine grained uh, label collection was helpful for training these uh, models. And so after we do the human uh, feedback preference data annotation, we use it to train two reward models, the safety reward model for harmlessness and the helpfulness reward model that judges if the model returns a helpful response or not. Um, we found that having two of these reward models was very useful. One thing before I discuss uh, and move on in more detail about some of the model improvements is that this entire thing is important to do it iteratively together. So if you only ever like do RLHF, but then you don't uh, train your reward model uh, based on new sampled interactions, then the model performance actually can suffer a lot. So it's really important that these two steps are done kind of together for every single latest model variant. How did this work out for us? Uh, I'll show this graph of iterative improvement. So the first thing is that we had two different versions of the supervised fine tuning model, which you see here as SFTV1 and SFTV2. And then we had five different versions of the RLHF model throughout our development process. So you see RLHF V1 all the way up to V5. Uh, V1 through V4, they only use rejection sampling. And then V5, we do the PPO step that I mentioned uh, before. So what are you looking at? The y-axis here represents the percentage of prompts um, that are percentage harmlessness. So this is a safety metric. And the x-axis is the percentage helpfulness. Um, and so let's look at the left here. So this is using our reward model that we developed internally to judge uh, which percentage you, know, you fall on. And the most important thing to, to see here is that it's, qu it's quite linear, the improvement. And so you're able, well, we were able over time to slowly uh, improve upon our performance in both axes. And so there wasn't like a huge trade off between making a model very safe and making it helpful, which is, I think, a very important finding that we can do both. Um, so that was with our own internal reward models. You can also use GPT 4 as a judge, where you use the GPT 4 model and you ask it, OK, which, which response do you like better? Um, this is kind of like an external judge. So you see it on the right here. And you see overall very similar behavior and the kind of like linear improvement. Although, of course, different reward models are calibrated different ways. And so the percentage uh, is not strictly comparable. Here, I show a lot of. Uh, you know, automatic evaluation, but we also do a lot of human evaluation as well. And so the human evaluation we do, we evaluate about 4,000 different uh, prompts for uh, helpfulness and 2,000 different prompts across a variety of different safety categories to evaluate harmlessness. Um, and what we find is, in general, so first of all, human evaluation, it's quite subjective, especially because there are some prompts where just like many, many responses are valuable. And so we do note that the inter-annotator agreement rate is not as high as you would expect, for example, in like other NLP type tasks such as machine translation, where like, you know, if you're evaluating the accuracy of a translation, usually people agree a lot more. The other thing that we learned from a lot of our human evaluation work is that the the distribution of prompts that you send for evaluation heavily affects you know, your evaluation quality because people care about such a wide variety of different topics. And so how many medical prompts do you include in your evaluation? How many legal prompts? And so it's very challenging to have a representative evaluation data set across. And so overall, we found that a lot of um, through automatic and human evaluation of our pre-trained and our fine-tuned model, we find that Llama 2 is a very competitive model. So if you compare it to things like um, open source models like Falcon or Llama 1, uh, we have significantly better performance. Um, if you compare it to things like GPT 3.5 or Palm, the performance is quite competitive, although I will note there's still a significant gap between Llama 2 and something like GPT 4. Uh, I also want to talk a little bit about a couple things that I found pretty interesting that we, you know, uh, 
I investigated as different unique model kind of things that we learned that it could do. A lot of this, of course, is covered in the discussion section of the paper. So one of the things that I found that we really liked was this kind of like temporal perception. So the question is, if you give the model a bunch of data, is it able to actually generalize that concept, or is it just kind of like memorizing the pattern of the training data? So the first example you see here is uh, on the left. So you, you tell the model, OK, you don't know anything past 1940. So that's your knowledge cutoff. That's all you know. And then you ask it, OK, who won the Second World War? The model response is, I only know stuff up to 1940. So I'm not sure, uh, which I think is pretty cool. The next two responses are both answering the question, is Earth flat or is Earth round? The middle here is saying that your knowledge represents kind of modern day 2023 knowledge. And the other example is, I think, 852. Um, and so if you asked 2023, the model is able to say, like, yeah, most, most people think the Earth is round. So that's great. But for 852, um, you know, it gives you, a, I think, an explanation in the first paragraph that, yeah, many people thought that Earth was flat back in 852 uh, due to various like, religious beliefs or something like that, although some portion of the population did think it was round, uh, not, fully, not fully decided. Another thing that was pretty cool is a little bit of the emergent tool usage. So this is something we didn't extensively explore uh, in the Llama 2 paper, but we still noticed that was pretty cool. Uh, a lot of the work that has been done on different plugins, for example, is in the same theme. And so the idea of emergent tool usage is that we tell the model what kind of tools it has access to, and we try to see if it can use them. So in this example I'm showing here, you tell the model, OK, you have access to search, like a search engine, and you have access to a calculator. And we show uh, the model, OK, this is how you would format this API call in this kind of like generic uh, format that we give it. And then we ask a question, OK, we want to uh, compare when did sharks appear on Earth, when did trees appear on Earth, and then you got to do the subtraction between them and output the final response. And so the model looks at the tools that it has, looks at the example API call. So it makes three different API calls. The first one it makes um, is that when did sharks appear? gets a response. Second one is, when did uh, trees appear on Earth? And then the third one is it tries to combine these two different API calls. Um, and it does a subtraction step. And then it answers to you at the bottom, you know, uh, sharks appeared on Earth 65 million years <laughs> uh, um, before trees did. And so this is uh, something that people are very interested in studying. This is something we just observed. Uh, definitely something we want to uh, dig into more. So I kind of want to want to end. Well, so I felt I, I felt like we needed a picture of an actual llama. So this is like what I came up with from my honeymoon <laughs> many many years ago. So I think the biggest takeaways I have are you know we're really really excited by what the community can develop. And if you listen to this talk, like so many of the things that I've described are not things that we developed at Meta, uh, but things that the community in general has broadly developed and that we rely on. And so that's something that really excites us about working collaboratively with the rest of the academic community. And so we're really excited by that. When I think about large language models, there's so much progress has been made, but there's still so many open questions to be resolved. So when Antoine introduced me, I mean, I personally, have, of course, having worked in translation, I'm always really interested in multilingual. I get we have a very exciting multimodal talk later. But there's also fundamental questions that we still need to answer in the research space around the hallucination uh, behavior of a lot of these models, the fact that they probably need to be a lot more factual and a lot more precise, as well as a lot more safe to be used in a lot of widespread applications, especially things like medical or economic or legal. And I think there's also a lot of interesting questions about scalability and the architectures, as well as the kind of data um, that goes into them. And so I'm really, really excited to see what comes. And ultimately, I guess our, our biggest thing is like, yeah, let's all keep building uh, as a group and see what we can come up with. Thank you so much. So thank you, Angela, for that fantastic talk. Uh, we have some time for some Q&A. Uh, so if there's any questions from the audience, uh, we have folks with microphones that are willing to climb up the, the rafters to, to hand them off. So I think we have a first question right here. Hello. Thank you for the talk, Angela. It's very interesting. Um, I do not work in the field, so this might be, this might be the stupidest question you've heard. But looking at the uh, chart where you show helpfulness and harmlessness, does it make you wonder if you're measuring the two things properly? I would have thought that there would be a tug of war. 
but there's none. Yeah, I think the biggest question is like, what is the right balance uh, between them? And so I think, I don't know how many of you are on the Twitter community, but after we released Llama 2, there were definitely some tweets indicating we may have overdone the, the safety part. I think, um, how do you kill the Linux process? We refuse to answer. And also, how do you make spicy mayo? We also refuse to answer those. <laughs> um, and so I think it's definitely a challenge, especially because many things exist in a gray area. And so whether or not the model can, can give the right output is challenging, and also it's deeply contextual. So this is not something I discussed in my talk. But when we evaluate, there's a difference between kind of single-turn evaluation and multi-turn evaluation. So single-turn is like you give one prompt, the model has no other context, and you try to evaluate the performance. But many things as well need multi-turn. So you've built up this conversational history, and in the context of that conversation, something could be more helpful or more harmful. Um, and so that's something that I think is really important to capture. And one of the challenges as well with human evaluation is that we often evaluate on a much more limited set of prompts because we have like three different people rating each one, and it's hard to get the right expertise. And so I think you bring up a really good point that you know a lot of the metrics that we do are challenging. Um, and I'll, before I, I ramble too much, uh, for the pre-trained models, a lot of people evaluate with different academic benchmarks, like Big Bench Hard or MMLU or you know Common Sense Reasoning or a lot of things like that. But we were just discussing earlier, like a lot of those things are just generally present on the web, which means that there could be data bleed that affects like the reliability of some of that evaluation. And so I think as we continue to develop this as a field, evaluation research is actually extremely critical. Hello. Um, very, very interesting talk. Um, I'm working on the safety space as well, and I was interested in knowing a little more about uh, the GPT-4 as a, a judge. Um, how does the prompt look like? Did you have to describe the entire uh, policy for helpfulness and, and for uh, harm, harmfulness? And have you also tried to use Llama itself as the judge to judge itself? Yes, yes, great questions. So I think that we have an entire section in the paper on safety as well as like a, a lot of appendices that provide like more detailed examples so you can experiment. Um, with GPT-4 as a judge, yeah, you can experiment with different prompts. Um, I don't think we noticed like huge variation. Uh, for Llama itself as a judge, we did try it, but I think since you know, we're training the model and we're doing the evaluation and we're developing everything and we're collecting the data. Like I think using itself, you can, you can kind of trick yourself, I think, into thinking that it's better. And so that's one thing why we always want to use our own reward models as well as use uh, external models. We also experimented with some other open source models as the judge just to try to understand directionally uh, if our model was trending in improvement or not. Um. In the um, description of RHLF, you said that um, the, in addition to open source uh, data sets, you created your own high quality smaller data sets. Uh, data set, and I was just wondering if it is uh, going to release that. Is, is it may be made pu public? Question. Yeah, I believe our data set is not released um, for the supervised fine tuning aspect. Um, yeah. Se second question in the. <laughs> Presentation and um, the final slide about APIs. Uh, you didn't specify actually if the tool uh, has access to an API. It was just simulating access. Yeah, in the in the example I showed, it's just simulated access. So after we train the model, there's a section of the paper where we tried to understand different types of emergent behaviors. This is an area where I think really like more work needs to be done. You know, the tool usage is not particularly robust. If you make it like very different API calls or very different formats, you know, it's not able to do that. But I think it's like an exciting direction to indicate the models have this kind of generalization capability. Uh. Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, I was wondering if you've noticed some difference uh, in the um, impact of human evaluation for different NLP tasks, or if you're not interested in like checking the data. <laughs> no, no worries. Um, so when we developed Llama 2, we were definitely focused on you know evaluating the quality of the chat behavior. So we didn't evaluate the performance of other NLP tasks like summarization or translation heavily. Although there are some prompts that are like translate you know string here into Chinese that do get picked up. But compared to like 
you know, specialized evaluation in those fields, we don't uh, get into that very much. Um, the one exception is that for the pre-trained model, we do run the pre-trained model on various different existing benchmarks. So things like common sense reasoning, um, you know, is, is captured, um, some of the Q&A type questions, there's code, there's math, that kind of thing, but is not evaluated extensively in human evaluation. Okay. Thank you. Let's go to that Hello. side of the room. Yep. Hi, uh, thanks for the nice talk. So I'm more interested in the utility of language models. Now, uh, colleagues around me use language models, but mostly for improving their writing. You know, they're using it as a writer assistant. Now, some of the examples you showed is where you are prompting the language model for some facts. Now, do you think that we should be in future prompting these models for factual things or using them more as a writing assistant? And if the latter, if we are going to use them as writing assistants, should we be tuning them differently rather than just feeding in the data? To What's your opinion on that? Yeah, good question. And I think there's a lot of exciting talks throughout the day that we'll get into like other types of practical applications of these language models that I'm also very excited to listen to. So I think depending on what people use them for, of course, you should change the fine-tuning data domain and maybe even the fine-tuning strategy to be able to support that. So uh, as a writing assistant, you know, many people also use it as like multi-turn. So that's where the kind of chat comes in, where you're like, hey, do this. Oh, wait, change that. Or no, 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 like let's insert that back in. For a lot of the factual type use cases, I think significant research work needs to be done to improve the factuality of some of the, the models. They oftentimes, they don't really know if they know the answer. And many times, you know, you would rather be like, if the model is not sure of the answer, can you just please tell me, <laughs> you know, that you're not sure of the answer. Another behavior I think that people have discovered, uh, you know, if you tell the model it's wrong, um, and you insist very uh, drastically that it's wrong, the model will be like, oh yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, I was wrong. So one, one example I really like is like if you ask it, okay, how much sugar is in Diet Coke, my favorite drink, there's no sugar, that's why I drink it. Um, but then if you're like, no, 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 it has 200 grams of sugar and you really, really insist this, the model will be like, oh, I'm so sorry, you're right. Which, you know, you stick to your guns, like you know that fact. <laughs> um, so I think those are the types of things that really need to be improved and are probably fundamental research questions before some of these models can be, uh, you know, in, in successful widespread application. Thank you. So I think we maybe have time for one more question. You know what, let's make it two. Go for it. Thank you very much. Uh, going forward with your uh, point on, um, I'm, I'm there. Here? This okay, all right, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, <laughs> okay. About this, uh, I mean, these are probabilistic models, right? So we have a, a, um, a knowledge of the probability of the, uh, of the answer of these models. Why we can never, as user, access these uh, this probabilities so that we have a feeling of the accuracy of, of the answer? Yeah, yeah, good question. So for those of you who are less familiar, so what language models actually output to generate the next word, they actually predict the probability distribution over the entire vocabulary space. Um, so for Llama 2, we have a 32,000 word vocabulary similar to Llama 1. And at each step, you look at the probability distribution and then you sample from it. And people usually use top K or top P sampling, which Antoine uh, referenced. And so I think because it's sampled at the token level uh, in order to generate, you know, I don't think it's a perfect calibration of like the, the probability of the entire uh, sentence or the confidence of it, although you can then sum, uh, of course, your token level generations into that. I think we have not done extensive research, but I have seen some papers, especially in the vision domain, that are like, oh, you know, is this an apple or is this a banana? Like, you know, tell the user how confident the model is. And I think for many practical applications, it's important to to almost like kind of teach users through some sort of like new user education um, type, you know, UI experience, like what this actually means. And so for some of the large language model work as well, I feel like you might know that the probability of the sequence is low, maybe because it was a really creatively written sentence in some sort of poetry generation, but it might not represent the core factuality. And so overall, I think your question kind of gets to the fact that like there's a lot more work to be done here in order to understand if a sentence is generated accurately or not. Thank you, and last question. Hey, thank you. Uh, you haven't touched on the, on the temperature and how that influences helpfulness and harmless. Can you, can you say something about it? 
Yeah, so we, we don't have like a direct uh, correlation between like more temperature or less temperature, but essentially in the, in the output distribution, the temperature affects the, the, the peakedness of the probability distribution that the model outputs at each time step. And so if you have a you know, very high temperature, you can sample into a little bit more interesting or more creative of a space, but then you can also sample into a space that's hard for the model to recover from. Um, and, or the generation gets like a little bit too wild. And also the temperature probably usually needs to be tuned based on the different models that you have. And so I think something that's very common is you'll take your model, you'll tune a lot of your inference time generation parameters, and then you can score the outputs according to your reward model, and you can get a sense of like which temperature parameter setting is the best. Thank you.